Well, today, I have a special treat for you. All the way from Dallas, Texas, the man who has written this book has changed my life, changed the trajectory of our church. Pastor Robert Morris is going to bring the word today. And listen to me. I want you to lean in. I want you to know that if you open your heart and, and, and not have a heart attack, you open your heart and allow God to speak to you in these truths. Everything in your life can change. I want you to get ready as we go into the next installment of Ducks in a Row. What Test by Pastor Robert Morris. Well, I want to uh, welcome uh, all the churches that are joining us by simulcast. And we're doing something a little differently this week. We, we developed a ticker to just run at the bottom of the screen right here at the first to be able to show the churches that are joining us. So if you're one of the churches, now let me just say, if CNN and Fox News can do a ticker, Gateway Church can do a ticker. <laughs> just want you to know. But if you're one of the churches that's joining us, they're in alphabetical order, and so you can look and, and see the name of your church, and you can give a shout out when you see the name of your church. I do wanna just give a, a shout out to all the churches, but also I wanna give a shout out to Gateway Church Scottsdale with Pastor Preston, they're joining us. And let's welcome all the churches that are joining us by simulcast. Let's just say welcome to them. So we do, do we do welcome you? That'll run just a little bit longer till we get to the end of the churches. So you guys can keep looking at that if you're uh, at another church and want to see the name of your church. Uh, but let me go ahead and start and tell you the title. Again, we're, we're in a series called The Blessed Life. And the title of today's message um, I got this title from something that I used to say a lot when I was in school. The title of this message is, What Test? <laughs> Any of you relate to this? <laughs> Did you ever have that experience? You walk into class <laughs> and everyone's got their books out and they're studying and they say, are you ready for the test? And you say, what test? What test? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't do well uh, in school. Um, <laughs> but I am proud of myself because I graduated in the top 10% of the lower one third of my graduating class. <laughs> so I'm, I'm proud of myself for doing that. But the reason I named it what test is because many believers don't know that there's a test in the Bible and you actually take this test every time you get paid. So let's, let's take a little survey here. Uh, all the campuses and all the churches that are joining us, uh, how many of you get paid once a month? Can I see your hand? Put your hand up. How many of you get paid either every other week or uh, uh, twice a month? Can I see your hand? So that's most of us. How many of you get paid every week? Can I see your hand? How many of you never get paid? You just, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. But if you ever get paid, <clears throat> You'll take a test. The test is, whom are you going to thank for your income? And you take that test by what you do with the first 10% of your income. Whom are, are you going to thank? Whom are you going to worship for your income? You know, some people thank Visa. It's the first one they pay. The only problem is that Visa does not have the power to bless your finances, Amen. but God does. So uh, turn to two passages, please. Malachi chapter 3, last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, and then 2 Chronicles 31. We'll go over there in a moment. And we're going to go through a lot of Scripture in this message. Uh, and I want to show you that tithing is scriptural, and it is in God's Word. So Malachi chapter 3 Verse 6, this is where we'll start, Malachi 3, 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change. That's very important. I don't change. I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Now, I think that's humorous. He says, I don't change. That's why I haven't killed you yet, uh, personally. That's what I think he's saying there. I was nice, and I'm still nice, all right? Verse 7. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances. Now, we're going to come back to that word ordinance. What does it mean? And have not kept them. Return to me, 
and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Now, before we read verse 8, let me just remind you, this is God talking. This is God, the God who does not change. This is the God who does not change talking. He said, you, you, you go away from my ordinances. I just need to probably tell you, the word ordinance means a principle of ordinary behavior. You've gone away from my principles of ordinary behavior for, for God's children. And they say, well, in what way? Now, I want you to notice this because this next verse, a preacher didn't make this up. Okay, this is God speaking. Verse 8, will a man rob God or steal from God? Yet you have robbed me. You've stolen from me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? Now watch again, this is God talking, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that would be the church, that there may be food in my house, again that's the church, and try, the, the old King James uses the word prove, uh, the English Standard Version uses the word test. Test me now in this, says, says the Lord of hosts. I just want you to notice how many times he puts says the Lord of hosts so we remember who's talking here. The one who can't change is talking. Test me, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, it, it, he's, this is God talking, and this is the God who can't change. You have to remember that. And he says, you've gone away from my ordinances. You've gone away from my ordinary principles of behavior. Uh, tithing is an ordinary principle of behavior for God's children to thank God for their income, for their harvest, for their increase. That's an ordinary principle. And he said, because you've gone away from my ordinary principles, you're under a curse now. And you need to understand, so many times we say, well, Christians can't be under a curse because Christ bore the curse of the law on the cross. He did. That is in regards to our salvation. But are you saying then that you can live any way you want and, and it doesn't affect you? Is that what you're saying? Because that's, that's just crazy to think that way. See, see uh, the, if, we, if we steal, there are consequences. A curse is a consequence. If you steal, there's a consequence. What if you steal from God? And, and so many people say, well, yeah, but the, the, the Lord owns it all. Yes, but he actually gives us stewardship over it, but he reserves 10% for himself. That's why he says you've stolen, because he says, I have set apart the tithe for the house of God. So if you keep it, you're stealing it. And this word is also used in Joshua 6 and 7 when they took the tithe they were supposed to bring. He said, Israel has stolen, stolen. And again, please, please hear me. I, I didn't make these words up. Th these are strong words. God says, you've stolen from me. You've robbed me. And because of that, you're under a curse. And I don't want you under a curse. I don't want you living under a curse. But you're voluntarily placing yourself under a curse because you're going away from my ordinary principles of behavior. Now, um, I had a conversation with the Lord one time about this passage because this is probably the most famous passage on tithing, although there are many passages on tithing, and I'll show you some of them today. But this is probably the most famous one. And so I had a conversation with the Lord one time, and I said, Lord, uh, uh, the number one reason that I hear that people don't tithe is they say, well, that's in the Old Testament. That's in the Old Testament. And so I said to the Lord, um, you know, Lord, you put this in Malachi 3, and then there's Malachi 4, and then Matthew 1. Couldn't you have just waited? I mean, just a little while? I mean, that you know, these verses only miss the New Testament by like 15 verses. I mean, couldn't you just waited just a little while and put it, you know what the Lord said? To him, I just felt in my spirit, he said, I put it right where I wanted it. And the reason is, here's point number one, because tithing is a test. Tithing is a test. See, God is testing our hearts. Even when a person argues about tithing, I think to myself, what is the spirit behind this? Why would this person argue 
when God gave his son for you and you won't even give him 10%. Why would you argue about this? It's amazing to me. I'm telling you, it's a test of your heart. It's a test. Now, uh, I, here's why I believe uh, he chose 10%. By the way, the word tithe uh, is a Hebrew word. Uh, ma'asra is the Hebrew word. And it means 10th part or 10%. 10th part. 10th. Okay, so that's where we, we get this from, that we know it's 10%. Okay. Here's why I think he chose 10%. First of all, I think he chose a percentage because it's fair to everyone. It doesn't matter if you make 30000 or 300000 It's a penny on every dime. It's the same for every person. Uh, but here's the reason I think he chose 10. Because for some reason, many times when you see the number 10 in the Bible, it represents testing. You'll actually see the word test with it. Uh, for instance, let me, let's, let's take a little test, all right? I'm going to ask, ask you a question, and I want you to answer me uh, out loud. Uh, all the campuses, all the churches, just say your answer out loud, all right? Here's the first question. How many plagues were there in Egypt? Ten, Ten right? Now, I could have said it a different way. I could have said, how many times did God test Pharaoh's heart? Because that's what he did, but we're familiar with how many plagues there were. All right, here's the second question. How many commandments are there? Ten, Ten okay. Um, now, I'm going to ask another question, and you might not know this, but there's a, a pattern <laughs> here, okay? And this is in Numbers 14 where God actually says this. You can read it later, all right? But, and then I want you to an say your answer just a little louder, okay? Uh, how many times did God test Israel in the wilderness? That's correct. All right. How many times, again, you might not know this, but okay. How many times were Jacob's wages changed? Ten. Ten. God was testing his heart. How many days was Daniel tested? Ten. How many virgins were tested in Matthew 25? Ten. How many days of testing are mentioned in Revelation? Ten. How many disciples were there? No, there were 12. I was just testing you. <laughs> I, was just, just, I was just testing you. So tithing is a test. And, but here's something that you might not know. It's a two-way test. God not only tests you, but this is the only place in Scripture that I've found where God says, you can test me. Amen. Test me. This word try, that is sometimes translated test or prove, uh, it comes from uh, the way you test a metal, the way you test gold to see if it's pure. You know what God is saying? Test me to see if I'm pure. Test me. I want you to. I want you to see because I want to open the windows of heaven. I want to bless you. I want to rebuke the devourer for you. But it depends on whether you're going to thank me and worship me and walk in faith and whether you're going to believe that 90% with God's blessing will go farther than 100% without. And you open an area of faith when we do this. Again, I hear people say things like, you know, is that Old Testament? Or someone will say, well, you know, that's under the law. Tithing was under the law. Well, first of all, I'll show you some scripture that tithing was way before the law, hundreds of years before the law, and after the law, and in the New Testament. So I'll show you those scriptures, all right? But uh, I don't understand that argument. Well, it was under the law, and I, I'm under grace now. Now, I'm not saying we do it because obviously we're saved by grace, but there are principles that were under the law that we should still walk in as believers. Thou shalt not commit adultery was under the law. Are you saying as a believer you can, you can walk in adultery and, there, and, and no consequences? Uh, thou shalt not murder was under the law. Are you saying that because it was wrong under the law, now it's right under grace? See, it's crazy. All right, let, let me give you an example. Um, uh, Pastor Todd, um, give me your wallet. Just, just give me your wallet, okay? Yep, there you go. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to keep this because thou shalt not steal was under the law. And I'm a believer, and so I can steal, and it's okay. Okay, let me just ask you something. Is that foolish? Yes. It's crazy. Yep. That's crazy. Okay, so I'm, because I'm not going to keep your wallet, there's not even any money in it. <laughs> so, all right, so there, you can keep your wallet. What'd you do? What'd you do? What did you do? Why is everyone, why is everyone laughing? You took your money out? I tell you before the service, I'm going to do this illustration, and you take your money out? Uh -huh. 
I'll get you back. All right. All right, here's number two. Number one, tithing is a test. Here's number two. Tithing is biblical. Biblical. You need to know that it's biblical. There are a lot of people that, that don't tithe, and, and here's really, you're, you're not a bad person if you don't tithe. You're not a bad person. Uh, I'm not saying that at all. Not at all. You're not a rebellious person. But a lot of people don't really believe it's in the Bible. They don't really believe it's for us today. So let me show you some scriptures, all right? We'll get to 2 Chronicles 31 in a moment. Genesis 14 Verses 18 through 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, Salem means peace, brought out bread and wine. There's a representation of, of communion even in the Old Testament. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him, now that's talking about Abram, Abraham, Abram, and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Now watch this. And he, that's Abram, Abraham, gave him, that's Melchizedek, a tithe of all. Okay, you, you need to know, if you don't know this theologically, this is about 500 years before the law. And Galatians says Abraham's our spiritual father. And Melchizedek, Hebrews says, is a type of Christ, and many theologians believe it's actually Jesus Christ because it says he has no gene genealogy. That's what Hebrews says, no mother, no father, no, no beginning of days, no end of life. It's pretty amazing. So he, it's either Jesus himself or a type of Christ. And our spiritual father tithes, gives 10%, 500 years before the law. Because it's a principle. And I'm going to take you next week and show you 2,500 years before the law the same thing. I'll show it to you next week, all right? Look, look at Genesis 28, verse 22. This is talking about Jacob. And this stone which I've set up as a pillar shall be God's house. Again, an implication that the tithe goes to God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. This is about 400 years before the law. Leviticus 27, 30. And all the tithe of the land, all of it, all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. In other words, it belongs to God. It is holy to the Lord. Remember the word holy means set apart. God has set it apart for him. That's the only reason he could say, you're stealing from me. Because I set that apart for my house, and if you keep it, then you're stealing it. Uh, Deuteronomy 26, verses 1 and 2. And it shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first... I'll show you next week in just a moment and later down in this passage how that refers to the tithe. First, of all the produce of the ground, which you shall bring from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you put it in a basket. Now watch this. And go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. Again, referring to church. Or you go to, you go to church. You go to a place where the Lord chooses to make his name abide. Then look at verse 13. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithe. In other words, the set apart 10%. The holy tithe from my house and have given them to the Levite, the stranger, the fathers, and the widow. He, he directed where the tithe was to go. According to all your commandments which you have commanded me, I have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I have not eaten any of it when in mourning. I didn't use some of the tithe when I went through a difficult time. Nor have I removed any of it for any unclean use. Think about how sometimes we use our money actually for sinful purposes. And some of it, and we might be using the tithe. And it's just amazing to me how the Bible says this. Nor given any of it for the dead, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God and have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people. I've removed the holy set apart tenth part from from my house, and I've given it, brought it to your house, Lord. And now, he says, you, you, after you do that, you can pray this prayer. Look down from heaven and bless your servant. Okay, let me ask you a question, all right? If Jesus himself, if Jesus himself said you ought to tithe, would you tithe? Okay, I'm going to go ask these people over here. Y'all in? Okay. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Let me ask all of you, okay? Campuses, all the churches. If Jesus himself said, 
you ought to tithe, would you tithe? Here's the sad part. Some of us still have to think about it. That the one that bled and died on the cross, if he said you ought to give 10%, we still have to think about it. Okay. So, let me put it another way. If Jesus said it, that you ought to tithe, in the New Testament, in red, (laughs) would you do it? You want to see the verse? Matthew 23, 23, Jesus is speaking. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe, 10%. A mint, anise, and cumin. Those are spices. And have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Watch very carefully. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Okay, here's what Jesus said. You guys... Give tithes, not only of your first fruits, but you even give tithes of the spices that you're going to put on your food. But you've neglected justice, mercy, and faith. Then Jesus says, you ought to do that. You ought to do that. But don't leave the other undone. Now, one time after service, a a guy came up to me and said, Pastor, I think that these you ought to have done refers to justice, mercy, and faith. I said, I don't, I don't think it does grammatically, and I don't think it does even in the original language, but I said, let's just say for a moment that, that your perspective is, is right. I, I, let's just say this. These you ought to have done refers to justice, mercy, and faith. I said to him, what does the rest of the verse say? Without leaving the other undone. I got you either way. <laughs> And you know, I'm, I'm joking. I'm not trying to be arrogant about this. I'm just trying to take a, a difficult subject and, and put some humor in. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. You tithe, but you don't do this. You ought to do that, but don't leave this undone. Or you ought to do those things, but don't leave that undone. Either way. I'm sitting here thinking, this is, I, I just, I'm hoping it's hitting you. I mean, it's Jesus. New Testament. Okay, Hebrews talks about, again, Melchizedek and Jesus and how mortal men receive tithes on this earth. But let me show you what Hebrews says. Talking about Jesus is our Melchizedek. Watch this, Hebrews 7, verse 8. Here, mortal men receives, receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Listen, you put your tithe in a plate or offering bag or basket or however the church does where you attend that, that receives that when you give your offering. Here we have boxes most people give online. However it is that you give your tithe. Mortal men, take care of it, manage it, things like that. But listen, in heaven he receives it, of whom it is witnessed he lives. Jesus Christ receives my tithes. That makes me want to tithe. So, uh, it is biblical, and here's number three. Tithing is a blessing. Tithing is a blessing. Okay, so let me tell you about uh, 2 Chronicles 31 now. We're going to read there. So, if you put a marker there at 2 Chronicles 31. Um, Hezekiah one day is reading the Scriptures. And he sees these verses about tithing. And they're in an economic recession. And he realizes we're under a curse, the whole nation, because we're not tithing. We're, we're stealing from God. So that's where we pick up this story, Second Chronicles 31, verse 4. Moreover, he commanded the people who dwelt in Jerusalem to contribute support for the priests and the Levites that they might devote themselves to the law of of the Lord. Now, just one, just just stop for just a moment. Um, remember, Malachi said, "Bring the tithe in the storehouse, that there may be food in my house." And again, they were talking about natural food, but think about it today: spiritual food. 
Right, let me just ask you something, all right? Do, when, you, when you come to church, do you enjoy the food, the spiritual food that you get? Do you enjoy it? Okay, someone's paying for it. Now, I know I'm being blunt. I'm not trying to be blunt. I'm not trying to be offensive in any way. I'm, I'm just, just a reality. Someone's paying for this building. Someone's paying for utilities. Someone's paying for the staff salaries. Someone's paying, not, not just for me to devote myself to the Word of God and to bring messages, but for uh, all the staff, for the youth ministry, for children's ministry, women's ministry, men's ministry, for the, uh, you know, teaching classes. For, for us, we, we have Kairos and Freedom Ministry and all this. Okay, someone's paying for that. Okay, let me, so let me ask you a question. Let me just put it in a, talking about food here, let me give you an analogy. Would any of you here go to a restaurant, eat a meal, and then leave without paying for it? Any of you? Some Christians do that every week. I go to church, eat a meal, and skip out on the check. Here's, here's the sad thing. You're the one that's hurting. I, I don't preach on tithing because the church needs money. We're, we're, we're doing fine financially. We're doing fine. As a matter of fact, speaking just to Gateway Church right now, you're the greatest giving church I've ever known in my life. You're phenomenal. So I'm not doing this because, you know, the elders got together and, we, you know, the budget's down. The budget's up. We're okay. I'm doing this. Listen to me. I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart, and I say this before God, I'm doing this because of you. I promise you I'm doing this to help you. This will change your life, your family, your finances, your marriage, your children, your grandchildren. This will change you. I promise you. All right, so he puts out, he says, everyone needs to bring the tithe to the house of God. Now, look at verse five. As soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits. Again, I'll show you next week how that relates to the tithe. Of grain and wine, oil and honey, and of all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. There it is right there showing you it's the tithe. And the children of Israel and Judah who dwelt in the cities of Judah brought the tithe of oxen and sheep. Also the tithe of holy things which were consecrated to the Lord their God, they laid in heaps. In the third month they began laying them in heaps and they finished in the seventh month. Now these months relate to the harvest, okay? And when Hezekiah and the leaders came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. Then Hezekiah questioned the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest from the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, again, the tithe always comes, it goes to the house of God, we had had enough to eat and have plenty left, for the Lord has blessed his people. And what is left is this great abundance. Okay, here's what happens. Uh, the, the king sends out the, this uh, commandment and says, we're, we're supposed to be tithing to the house of God. So the people begin doing it. They begin in the third month, which is a harvest time, but then there's another harvest, the seventh month, and they continue through that time. And, and so when the king comes to visit and he sees these heaps, heaps that the people brought to the house of God, here, here's what in essence he says. It says he questioned them about the heaps. Here's what he's saying. Are the people okay? Are they okay? I mean, look, look how much they've given. Or do they have enough left? And the priest said, oh, king, as soon as the people started to do it God's way, God so blessed them. What you're seeing here is just the 10%. If you think there are heaps here, go look at the 90%. Go look at how God blessed his people when they begin obeying his word. Uh, I've been in ministry now for over 30 years. I've heard two testimonies for that time about tithing consistent testimonies. You know, Scripture says in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Okay, here are the two testimonies people have said to me. Tithers consistently have said to me, we are so blessed. Boy, it all changed when we begin tithing. We are so blessed, Pastor Robert. We are so blessed. That's what tithers have said. Here's what non-tithers have said. I can't afford to tithe. That's their testimony. I can't afford to tithe. 
And, and again, not mean, not rebellious people, just I can't afford to tithe. Listen to me. You will never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe. Because tithing is what breaks the curse and rebukes the devourer. As soon as you start to get ahead, something else will break. Because the devourer. But tithing is what rebukes him. Okay. Um, let me give you one more illustration. Um, Jason and Steve and Todd, will, will you guys stand up? And if you guys will move down kind of toward Todd there uh, so that they can, everyone can get, a, you can get a shot of them for the other campuses and churches and all. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to give you an illustration. Let's say that I say to these three men, I'm, I'm going to go away for a while. And, um, and I've provided for Debbie, but I want to provide some additional funds for her. But I want to channel or funnel those funds through you three men. So I'm going to send all, each of you $10,000 a month. Okay? <laughs> Jason, don't get that excited. This is just an illustration. Um, <clears throat> okay. So... Uh, I'm talking to Debbie Everett, and I say it to, to you, but I want you to give Debbie 10% of it, $1,000 a month, and you can keep the 90%. Just give my wife 10%. So I'm talking to Debbie every day and, and letting her know, you know, it's an extended trip, but I'll be back in several months. I have to be gone. And after about three months, I, I think about these other funds, and I say, hey, how are the funds coming in from the, the three guys? You know, and uh, she said, well, uh, Jason sends $1,000 a month. Just like you said, as a matter of fact, it arrives like January 1st, February 1st. I mean, he's like clockwork, it's $1,000, so good, good job, okay? Um, I said, well, what about Steve? She said, well, Steve is sending $2,000 a month. I said, $2,000 a month? I, I didn't ask him for $2,000 a month. I just asked him for $1,000 a month. I know. I said, well, why is he sending two? I don't know. He just sends $2,000 a month. Hmm. I said, well, what about Trader? Uh, Todd, sorry. <laughs> Todd. <laughs> I said, what, 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 what about Todd? She said, well, we, we need to talk about Todd. <laughs> I said, well, why? What, what's Todd doing? Well, the first month he sent 700. The second month, 400. And this last month, he didn't send anything. Okay. Now, I want you to think about this. Think about this. How do you think that makes me feel? And I'm giving him the 10,000. It's coming from me. And I just asked him for 10% for my wife. He can keep the 90%. Hey, what do you, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to send him any more money. Because he's proven to me he can't be trusted. And I'm going to take what I'm giving him, and I'm going to give it to Steve and Jason. Because they've proven they can be trusted. Okay, you, you guys can sit down. Okay, now... Think about this. Jesus said, I'm going away for a while. Is that right? I'm going away, but I'm coming back. But while I'm gone, I want you to take care of my wife. 10%. You can keep the 90. Um, let me just, just to remind you, is the church the bride of Christ? Now listen to me very carefully. Tithing might be more personal to Jesus than what you thought. Because it's his wife. He has the power. And if you say, well, I can't believe you just take it away and give it to the others. If you don't think Jesus would do that, read the parable of the talents. When he took from the one that wasn't faithful and gave it to the one who was faithful. He wants to provide for you. But why would he provide and bless people who will not even be concerned about his wife? It's a test. And it's very important we pass this test. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes.